Hello everybody, it's Professor Hitch, and today I'm talking about a question I often get from people, which is, how do I stop feeling nervous when I speak English? So grab your notepad and pen and prepare to take note of the useful and interesting phrases that I use during this explanation. Now, I think, first of all, it's important to note that most people have some level of social anxiety, especially in unusual situations, and especially younger people. So, it's actually quite normal to feel nervous when you're doing something slightly unusual. And even if you're doing something kind of usual, like going to meet an old friend at a coffee shop, Sometimes you might have a, a small level of underlying social anxiety in that situation. And for some people, this anxiety is stronger, and for some people, it's less. And that is something that you can work on over time and improve. And I'll talk a bit more about my personal situation in a moment, but social anxiety is definitely something that I deal with and certainly dealt with a lot when I was younger. So the first lesson here is everyone to some extent feels nervous, especially when speaking another language. So you have to realize that's kind of normal. It's not that you're doing something wrong there. That's just to be expected. So you accept it and move on. And the reality is, and this brings me to my next point, that even when you're nervous, you can still speak. And it's true that your performance might be a little reduced. Again, that's normal. When I play guitar on my own, I play better than when I have someone listening to me. That's just what happens. It's the social pressure and realization of having someone watching you it's quite normal for that to affect your performance. The lesson to take away here is that if you improve your English when you're relaxed, although it won't be as good when you're nervous, it will still get better. So as your when I'm on my own English gets better, or when I'm speaking to a comfortable person like my teacher, my English gets better, then your nervous English, which might be l a lower level because you're nervous and it's more difficult to think about things, will still improve like this. So one thing you can do if you're very nervous and you feel that your English is being is affected so badly it makes it difficult for you to communicate, one thing you can do is just improve your English. And as you improve your English, the English that you speak when you're nervous will also get better. And actually that will give you confidence and you'll start to feel less nervous when you're speaking English as well. The next thing to consider is that mistakes are not a big deal. And I've talked before about the idea of accuracy versus fluency. And you should have it fairly clear in your head about when it's important to care a lot about accuracy and when it's important to disregard accuracy in the name of fluency. In the real world, fluency is king. I've said it before. It's all about fluency. The person who can express their ideas the quickest and in the most sort of succinct way uh, is often the person who gets their point across better even if they make a load of grammar mistakes and use the wrong forms of words and their pronunciation's a bit of a mess, they will still get their point across better than someone who is speaking with absolutely perfect grammar and pronunciation, but takes half an hour to make a point. So fluency is king in the real world and therefore disregard accuracy for the most part. Of course, you probably do want to care about your accuracy at some point, otherwise you'll just be speaking like uh, an English beginner, but very fluently. So the time to focus on your accuracy 
is when you're studying or when you're in an English class and you're doing some sort of controlled practice activity. So when you have someone there doing error correction and so on, it's a good time to focus on your accuracy. Another thing worth mentioning on this point is that English natives actually don't really care about other people making English mistakes. You have to understand that there are so many non-native English speakers now that native English speakers are very used to dealing with people with all kinds of different accents and different ways of speaking English. And for the most part, most people just accept that now. English people are very accepting, that is native English speakers, are very accepting of people speaking a whole different variety of English shoes. Um, so the mistakes really aren't that important for native English speakers. As you might find in other languages though, for example, um, sorry to pick on the Spanish, but um, when I was in Spain speaking Spanish, a lot of Spanish people would correct me and interrupt me if I made a mistake. And I found it quite harsh actually, in my experience, uh, watching my students and talking to my students about this, English native speakers don't tend to do that, which is a positive thing because it gives you confidence. It allows you to express yourself fluently. Another thing that I think it's worth mentioning is the idea of adopting a character in another language. Although it might be a little bit synthetic and uh, maybe overly playful for some people, it can be very useful to adopt a kind of character in another language. And, um, you know, I often do this when I kind of go into my Japanese mode and I start being like, Nanda sore, sore wa nandes, sumimasen. Um, and yeah, it's uh, a, bit, a bit of a joke, a bit, a bit fun, but it really does help kind of bring that language out of you and kind of give you this mode of expression, especially if in your own language you're not really like that, maybe you're a bit of an introvert, and then you can kind of ad adopt this sort of eccentric character in another language, and that can really help build your fluency confidence. And this moves on quite nicely to my story with teaching. I've been teaching now for about 15 years. I, I always say 15 years. It was 2008, you work it out. And, um, you know, I, I've never been a, a particularly strong public speaker, or I, I never was anyway. And I was never someone who was particularly confident in front of a crowd. But now when I'm in the classroom in front of 18, 20 people, sometimes I'll kind of jump around and go into a really bizarre and kind of wild character. And this is just something which has come out of me. It's almost like a bit of a role play and I kind of lose it a little bit uh, in a sort of funny way in front of people. And that's something I, I probably never would have seen myself doing, but over the time, it's almost like something that's easier to do than even be genuine, just be, be like sort of everyday me in front of people. It's easier to kind of to kind of go off into this extravagant on stage character almost. And this is something the the reason why I'm talking about this is because I think it's an analogy of my previous point about adopting a character in another language. It's something that can give you confidence in a situation which you might otherwise feel social pressure. My next point is to say that you should start to take pride in your language. And this is an idea that has been milling around in my head for some time and has been solidified by, I've recently been reading a book called Atomic Habits. And in that book, it talks about how making something your identity is one of the best ways of actually improving it. Uh, because you make it your identity, it becomes a behavior, and then it becomes something that you do a lot of and you get good at. So when you take pride in something in, the la in your language, that's like saying, I'm not learning English, I'm an English speaker, or I'm not improving my pronunciation, I'm, I'm someone with good pronunciation in English, and I'm going to make it better. But you, you know, you find one aspect of your language which you're proud of, whether it's your British sounds, or your exceptional vocabulary, or your idioms. I know some students get very proud about their idioms, and then they learn all these idioms, maybe a bit too many idioms, but still, that pride 
and that identity helps them to boost their spoken English sort of to the next level. And finally, there's a little phrase which can give some people a little boost of confidence or at least make them feel more relaxed. And that is to say something like, sorry for my English or, you know, sorry if I make mistakes with my English, something like that. Now, I want to say it is actually fine to to say that. I'm not of the belief that you have to stop apologizing for your English or whatever. Some people might tell you that. I think it's fine if it makes you feel relaxed. Just realize that you're doing it to be polite. You're not doing it because you're a bad English speaker. You're just doing it to be polite. That's all. Just giving someone a heads up. You know, sometimes I might choose the wrong word. Sorry about that. You know, deal with it. And as I've said before, this is actually more of an issue when you're speaking to other non-native speakers, because native speakers in general won't really pull you up on errors. And native speakers, I think, are getting quite good now at dealing with a whole range of non-native speaker levels, because there's so many non-natives out there, and they're a part of our communities, societies, and countries, and um, people in general, natives are just getting good at communicating with non-natives with lower or higher levels. So there are all my thoughts for the day. I hope you found this video useful, and I hope that you've got some nice, tasty, spicy vocabulary from it. Thank you very much for watching. Do smash that like button. Do comment down below. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why are you not subscribed? I'm intending to do some live streams on this channel soon, so I hope to see you there. Catch ya later.